Welcome to Philosophy 3400 Ethics. Today we're going to look at the general principle of morality, a lecture by Immanuel Kant. Um, I'm going to just begin by noting a connection to our previous reading, Theodore Adorno's 11th lecture from Problems of Moral Philosophy. Adorno there, you'll remember, claims that the sort of the fundamental principle of morality for Kant is reason. And so I want us to remember this characterization Adorno has helpfully given us as we now actually look at what Kant himself has to say about morality. Because we'll see that, of course, Adorno um, was doing a very good job of summarizing um, Immanuel Kant here. Having considered, uh, no surprise, Adorno studied with uh, some famous Kantians uh, in the early 20th century, so he knew his Immanuel Kant very well. Let's look on page 11. This is at the towards the beginning here of the lecture. We must now see, Kant writes, we must now see wherein the general principle of morality consists. What is the general principle of morality? So the way put his question so far, Kant goes on to say, we have said no more than that it, the general principle of morality, rests upon the goodness of the free will. We must now investigate what it essentially is. So in saying that, you know, the general principle of morality rests upon the goodness of the free will, I suppose this is actually a helpful reminder that in a sense, you know, the, the basic principle is going to be logical consistency and reason, yes, but that alone is not enough. This this language of the goodness of the free will is very important too, um, because it's not just that a person is supposed to reason in a universal manner, that is reason in the same sort of way that any rational agent in that kind of situation would be thinking along the same lines, right? So there's supposed to be some sort of universal process of reasoning going on, but in addition, there needs to be present as well a good will, as Kant will elsewhere call it, or the goodness of the free will. That is, we have to be not merely understanding through the use of our reason what we should be doing, what we or anyone else in this position that we find ourselves in should be doing in some domain. We also, in addition for, this, for our action to be moral, need to be doing what we are supposed to do with a good will, freely doing it, choosing to do it, recognizing that anyone in this situation should do this, including us, and we then do it with a good will, as opposed to doing it, say, filled with seething resentment. Why do I have to stop at this stop sign at a four-way stop? I hate this. I'm just not, I don't want to do it, so I'm going to not really do it, or I'm going to do it, but seethe with resentment as I do it. In that case, you'd be sort of, you'd be doing the thing that reason advises you to do, and that reason would advise anyone, any rational agent in that situation to do, but you would not have the goodness of your free will involved. And th thus your action would not actually be moral, even though you would be obeying your duty, in a sense, with resentment and hostility. In any case, what is this general principle of morality. Look to the bottom of page 11 now, and we find an interesting observation by Kant here. Morality, Kant argues, has either an empirical or an intellectual basis. We either sort of learn it from our experience and through our sense organs as the primary vehicle here for data, or Maybe morality has an intellectual basis, and it has to do, you know, with our minds and the use of our brains, and thus, in a sense, morality only really exists for human beings, and we don't, for instance, um, fault animals for doing things um, that we would consider immoral were a human to do them. Animals, for example, are put down if they harm or murder a human being, right? But they are not put on trial. They are not represented by lawyers, right? Why? Because we, we understand perhaps there's an intellectual basis to morality, and if an animal lacks the intellect for morality, then we can't hold that animal responsible. That's just one example, right? 
of why you might think morality has an intellectual basis and what that might mean, what its implications might be. So Kant's going to say either morality is empirical, empirically rooted, or rationally rooted. That's another way to put it, right? It's either something that requires empirical data and the sifting through of that data and the understanding of what we learn from experience to arrive at morality, or it's something that we can simply use our minds to figure out independently of experience that will be Kant's position, right? So, spoiler alert, right? Kant's going to offer the second option here. So, morality has either an empirical or an intellectual basis, and it must be derived either from empirical or from intellectual principles. Empirical grounds are derived from the senses, as far as the senses find satisfaction in them. Intellectual grounds are those in which all morality is derived from the conformity of our actions to the laws of reason. This is Kant's position. Accordingly, sistema morale est, oh boy, we're in Latin here, apologies. Accordingly, sistema morale est, uh, boy, my pronunciation is so uh, rusty at this point. Sistema morale est, uh, how did I pronounce the V's? I, I code switch between German and Latin at this point. Sistema morale est vel empiricum vel intellectuale. Boy, the vels here. Either or in Latin. Um, so let's just let's just translate it into English. I can pronounce English better than I can pronounce Latin at this point, even though I can read Latin. Isn't that sad? Um, accordingly, a moral system is either empirical or intellectual. That's all it says there in Latin. Um, so, and as I've said, right, we can, you know, Kant's going to tell you why uh, an ethical system based upon empirical grounds is sort of doomed to failure. He's ultimately going to argue for an intellectual basis for morality. So, in other words, to figure out what the right thing to do is, you have to use your mind, and you have to use logical principles, and you have to sort of hold yourself to some reasonable standard that is universal, that holds for everyone. In other words, there's a rule that you follow, that everybody follows, and uh, and it's that simple. And how do you, you know, figure out these rules? Well, you ask yourselves, for instance, right, how can we all do what it is we're doing here, say, travel around on the roads and private automobiles in a reasonable manner so that nobody has to die or be injured unnecessarily, right? And, the, and then that leads then to a sort of system of norms and of rules that help facilitate the safe passage and convenient and speedy passage as much as that's possible and then there are certain rules that everyone must follow and we call these the rules of the road okay and Kant would only you know Kant would add to this right before you're driving to actually be good driving not only would you have to follow the rules of the road, but you'd have to understand actively with your mind why those rules are the way they are. And then you'd have to follow them with what he calls a good will. That is, it's sort of an, an, a, you are freely choosing to follow the rules, completely understanding why they exist and why they are reasonable. Boy, Kant, when I get out there on Highway 99, I just don't see much evidence of this from other drivers and even from myself sometimes if I haven't slept well so then again as Adorno pointed out right Kant's ethics here is telling us how the world should be and not how it is <laughs> it's on all of us to make the world to the better place that it should be every day but the decisions we make are we doing what is reasonable with a good will or are we not doing what's reasonable and do we have a bad will <laughs> an ill will so Kant's going to, you know, offer objections here to the position. Here's his strategy, right? He's going to first articulate the thesis that maybe morality has an empirical basis, and then he's going to probably identify a contradiction in that thesis and thus refute that thesis, and that then leaves him with the only other alternative he thinks that is possible. So he's getting to the position that he's going to advocate um, by refuting the position that is opposed to his own. And if you buy, if you are convinced that morality has to have either an empirical or an intellectual basis and there is no third possibility, as Kant thinks you should be, you will then be able to um, 
support your position for an intellectual basis by refuting the only alternative. The bottom of page 12. We judge all actions in a customary way by what we have been taught or what the law tells us. So this seems to be support for the position that morality is rooted in empirical experience. How do we know whether something's right or wrong? How do we judge actions of ourselves or others as right or wrong? Well, we've been taught by our parents, by our elders and authorities in our community what is right and wrong, and the law also tells us what is right or wrong. And thus, we learn about right or wrong through our experience of, of the laws, of learning what the laws are. That's going to be the empirical position, according to Kant. And now let's look for Kant's objection to this on page 13. So on these grounds, it's a thesis that morality has an empirical basis. It's not permissible for reason to pass ethical judgments on actions. In other words, what is your what are the customs of your community? What does the law say? Your reason, your, your principles that you formulate with reason, who cares, right? Um, because the idea being here um, that morality is passed to us through the experiences we have learning from others in our community and through the authority of our legal institutions. And so we, the only way to sort of know is to sort of take our cues from these pre-existing institutions. He says, Kant's going to go on, though, and say, right, so we, on this thesis, it's not permissible for reason to pass ethical judgments on actions. You know, incidentally, an insight like this is, I think, part of, you know, what motivates a thinker in the United States, Henry David Thoreau, um, to argue for civil disobedience, right? Thoreau's argument in, in his essay on civil disobedience is precisely, yes, it is permissible for me to reason and pass ethical judgments on actions precisely because the community I live in is instilling immorality into its young and the laws that I am subject to in this nation, the United States in the 1840s, are unjust laws, laws that promote slavery and the illegal conquest and annexation of, um, of of Mexican territory in, in the war with Mexico. The theft of land, imperial conquest, slavery, these are all codified into our legal system, Thoreau says, and that's why you got to break the law, precisely to be a moral person. If you want to be a good person, um, you've got to break the law for Thoreau. But you break the law based on reasonable principles. Um, that is, on principles that articulate why the law itself is unjust and must be broken or changed, reformed, um, or abolished in some cases. Anyways, so according to this thesis that uh, morality is rooted in empirical experience, it is not permissible for reason to pass ethical judgments on actions. Instead, we act by reference to customary example and the commands of authority, from which it follows that there is no ethical principle, right, unless it's one that we borrow from experience. But now, Kant says, in the empirical system, the first principle of ethics is based upon contingent grounds. In other words, what does your community say? What are, what are your existing laws on the books? This is contingent in the sense that depending on what time, what era you live in, what year it is, and what specific nation you live in, these laws will be incredibly different. May even be the opposite in one place as it is in another place, or the opposite at one time than it is at another time. And so the basis for morality on this empirical model is necessarily going to be a contingent basis, subject to change, sort of random in a sense. You don't get to choose what empirical um, system you don't get to choose sort of what your experience is going has been that leads you to become an ethical agent here and what this means again is going to be that the very opposite sorts of things will be good in one place bad in place bad in another place the very same person will be deemed entirely moral in one area entirely immoral in another country or at one time you'll be a hero and they'll build a statue for him and then a few hundred years a few hundred years later they'll tear the statue down, right? Because that hero, turns out, wasn't a hero. That's what happens, according to Kant. 
when you root your morality in some sort of empirical system on contingent grounds. You have this issue. All your heroes turn out to be racist scoundrels. So don't do that, this God's advice. <laughs> don't base your morality on these kinds of empirical contingencies. Where was I born? What year was it? You know, um, what nation was I born in? What was our what were our traditions? Let's just do that. What were our laws? Let's just continue them and carry them forward. In the case of self-love, contingent circumstances decide the nature of the action which will advantage or harm us. Okay, where ethical feeling is the basis and we judge actions by liking or disliking, by repugnance or in general by taste, the grounds of judgment are again contingent. Okay. Um, where ethical feeling... So now he's attacking, you know, the theorists of the sort of sentimental view of morality. This is a common moral theory and ethical theory in the 18th century and the idea and this is rooted with Protest, you know it's uh, connected to protestantism and it has to do with this idea that we have a sort of inner spark of divinity we have these feelings a conscience in a sense but a conscience understood as an emotional sort of reaction that sort of tells us or your heart will tell you when something feels wrong or right um, and Kant's pointing out again that if you make this kind of move and you say that we have these kinds of feelings um, that sort of tell us um, whether something is right or wrong, again, this will be contingent, as he puts it, right? People can have these, people can find, you know, <laughs> there are different strokes for different folks, essentially. I suppose is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, and so that will be a problem again, is that, you know, the thing that one person finds pleasing and thus good in some sense and that their inner feelings seem to support will be deemed repulsive and disgusting by somebody else. So in other words, these sort of mysterious feelings that well up in us and that we sort of use as a kind of mystical guide here are going to be profoundly different in different people. And thus, you'll have um, opposites, essentially, both claim it to be instances of morality. You'll have opposed sensations. It, it, it just, uh, it's not just, he's pointing out you would have, you know, all sorts of variability here. It's that you would literally have, you know, one person deeming something good because it makes them feel warm and fuzzy inside while another person deems that very same thing disgusting and repulsive because it makes them want to vomit. It's the same, he says, with the outer grounds of education and government. In other words, you know, our system of education, our government, we can't look to these institutions to instill morality in us either because systems of education and governments themselves are contingent. In other words, they, there has not been one educational system across all cultures over the last several thousand years. There has not been one type of government enacting the same sorts of laws everywhere on the face of the earth over thousands of years. And because of this, then there's going to be such variation and variability in all these different educational systems and governments that you will not find any sort of consistent advice. You will find some places and times producing one kind of person, whereas another place and time produces the exact opposite. And they both consider such folks to be paragons of success. Okay, so let's continue forward then. This then, you know, so Kant thinks, you know, he's shown that we can't um, base our morality on any kind of empirical ground because if we do so, we then make the principles of our morality entirely contingent. And what that means is now they can be this later or in some other place, they can be the exact opposite of this and thus you can have completely contradictory principles. You can have completely contradictory um, actions, for instance, deemed good or bad. You know, an example of what Kant's getting at here is the famous story told in Herodotus's histories. And I can't remember the Persian king who's mentioned here, but maybe it's Darius. There's a Persian emperor king um, who 
wants to prove to his court, to all the people present in his court, that, you know, the human beings are governed by this kind of empirical custom, you know, this, empir this empirical ground of customs and traditions and institutions. And to prove his point, he asks, you know, a group of, of from a certain tribe in ancient India, how they bury and honor their dead and their response is that they eat them. And I think there was a tribe in India at one time that practiced a form of cannibalism um, as part of their burial rituals. Um, something that incidentally has, you know, occurred in various cultures throughout history. It may even be happening at the present day. In any case, you know, then he talks to another group of folks uh, from a tribe in Greece, and he asks them, how they bury and honor their dead, and their answer was that they burn them. Um, and and then he has both of the groups sort of uh, react to each other's practice, and of course each group is absolutely disgusted by what the other group does to bury and honor their dead. But the idea, of, and, and for, for Darius or whoever, Xerxes or whoever this Persian king is, that's supposed to illustrate that custom is king, as, as Pindar puts it, and this is another source for that insight. Custom is king. Custom determines morality for human beings, and isn't we can hilariously prove this by showing how one group of people does, the, that the very actions that one group of people do to bury and honor their dead are the are among the most blasphemous and obscene things you could do in this other context to the dead, and it works both ways. Now, for Kant, though, that would actually illustrate this kind of a paradox, would illustrate not that custom is king, but that custom is, or, or that if custom is king, it's an impotent ruler here, right? It's utterly contingent. And so the idea is maybe both sides are wrong. Like, what if that's the insight that you draw from this kind of a story, that the problem here is that there is no rational basis for what you do with the dead, and we are thus left on sort of a contingent ground. It's whatever your tribe, your tradition has taught you. And of course, what the implication then is some of what is customary for you is literally sort of either blasphemous or, or punishment or criminal in another context. And so the, you're going to have this problem constantly between cultures and even within nations if they are diverse and etc. And you'll never escape from that kind of a problem, Khan thinks, so long as you are building your moral philosophy on contingent empirical grounds. So in the second system, uh, Sistema Morale, in the second moral system, let's not overcomplicate this, Khan, he loves to quote Latin because at the time he's giving these lectures in Germany, Latin is still a language of, of learning. Um, and so his audience is fluent, you could say, in Latin as well as German. So he just moves between the two. In the second moral system, which is the intellectual, the philosopher judges that the ethical principle has its ground in the understanding and can be completely apprehended, a priori, can be completely apprehended without reference to experience. That's what you need to get there. We say, for instance, thou shall not lie. On the principle of self-love, this would mean, right, don't lie if it gets you in trouble, right? But if you can get away with it, then tell a lie. That is not what the Old Testament commandment is talking about, right? But that does seem to be the operative principle you know, in our political sphere and, and in most places today, um, at least for a large number of people, right? Better to have to, what's the expression? Better to have to um, apologize and, and ask somebody for something, or I can't remember. In any case, the idea here is, you know, thou shall not lie, right? He said, and that's a simple, you know, one of the commandments here that from the Old Testament that Kant thinks um, is pretty universal. Um, he thinks this is actually something that is, is that you would, you know, you'd find with a wide range because ultimately for Kant, not, you don't have to go out there and survey all these different cultures and see if it's present or not, but he thinks because this is one of the rational and intellectual principles, or because it relies on a rational and intellectual principle at the basis of morality, we should expect to see then human communities 
um, using and employing it. So, if ethical feeling were the basis, then a person devoid of refined ethical feeling would be at liberty to lie. So again, he's not going to be a sentimentalist here. He's not going to say that feel feelings don't really matter um, for Kant. Um, it's nice if you have good feelings about what you're doing, but at the end of the day, you got to do the right thing. And you got to you know, condition and train yourself to have the proper feelings. Um, so if ethical feeling were the basis, then a person so devoid of a refined ethical feeling would be at liberty to lie. It depended on upbringing and government, our educational system or laws in place. If we were brought up to tell, if it depended on upbringing and government then, if we were brought up to tell lies, and if the government so ordained, it would be open to us to tell lies, right? So in other words, what if you know your educational system trains you to do this? What if your government says it's okay to do it? However, Kant says, again, we'd be in this situation where um, we'd sort of get mixed messages. And I honestly do feel like we have these mixed messages today, right? It's wrong to lie, but it's okay to stretch the truth or something if it's advantageous for you. And if you don't, you don't, sort of outright harm somebody else in the process or something. Um, now, if the principle lies in the understanding, and this is the advantage of Kant's position, he thinks, if the principle lies in the understanding, we say simply, thou shalt not lie, no matter what. He says, this, if I look into my free will, expresses the consistency of my free will with itself. In other words, I am capable, if I so choose, to not lie, no matter the circumstances. I have that power. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> Um, right? Um, there's a movie um, from about 25 years ago with starring Jim Carrey called Liar Liar that always comes to my mind right now, right? Somebody who is cursed at the beginning of the movie, um, cursed. The curse is that he can no longer lie and he inevitably has to speak the truth in every situation he finds himself in and the comedy is just watching what happens when he's no longer able to lie. So I want us to maybe, I'm not gonna suggest you go and watch that movie as a counterpoint to what Khan is talking about here, but something to think about, right? Imagine, imagine never lying. Yeah. You have that power. You are freed to not lie. Nonetheless, you know, there, maybe there's a little something here that Khan's not picking up on. That would make that impractical or incredibly difficult or you know um, something he may be overlooking here he says if i look into my free will this this idea that i shouldn't lie ever expresses the consistency of my free will with itself in other words right i have a rule and i follow it and there's never an exception to that rule it's a necessary law of the free will such principles, which are universal, constant, and necessary, have their source in pure reason. They cannot be derived from experience. Okay, and so we might think, well, how does this have its, you know, basis in something beyond experience? And for Kant, it's just a matter of analyzing sort of the logic at stake here. The reason that we should always tell the truth at all times is because the activity of communicating with our fellow human beings relies on the assumption that our communications are accurate. So for example, you may have had somebody once come up to you and ask you what time it is. People routinely ask each other questions with the expectation that the information they get, how do I get to this store? Where's it at? It's down the street, past the second light, you take a left. The assumption in our everyday communication with folks is that we're generally being truthful and honest. And once you begin to make an exception for yourself, I can tell a lie or I can not be truthful anytime it's convenient for me for some reason and advantageous. Well, ultimately, if everyone acted that way and told lies whenever it was convenient for them, we would live in a world where nobody could trust anyone else and trust anything anyone else was saying. I kind of feel like maybe we do live in that world, frankly, Connor. Kind of especially after this last election, but nonetheless, right? He's, he, what he's pointing out here is, is the idea that everyone else should tell the truth, but I get the right to tell lies whenever I want, destroys the possibility of honest and open communication between people that we all are already committed to every day. When we, even the liar, Kant would say, 
has to rely on the general truthfulness of others in order to effectively lie. It's self-defeating, literally, um, he thinks, to build exceptions to the rule and then to violate the rule whenever it's convenient. It will ultimately, for instance, destroy, again, destroy reliable communication between people. And that would then lead to a destruction of our ability to live together in society. Again, maybe that is in fact happening right now. Um, can anybody believe anything that anyone else says, right? Okay. Um, so, let's keep going. On page 14, Kant argues that the intellectual principle at the basis of morality may be of two kinds. It can be internal. Does this depend on the inner nature of the action as apprehended by the understanding? Can it be, or it could be external, and our actions would bear some relation to an eternal, sorry, an external being. Now, what does he go on to say? And now he's going to sort of get into the realm of theology here a little bit. Just as we have an ethical theology, so we have a theological ethics, the external intellectual principle is of that kind. But it is false because discrimination between moral good and evil does not depend on any relation to another being. Here he's having, uh, you know, he is rejecting the position that anyone, any human being, has some privileged relationship with a divine being that thus gives them special access to moral principles. Not because he's a non-believer. Kant is, not, is, is a religious person and a Protestant. Um, he just believes that um, we can't, I mean, how to summarize this position here? I mean, one way to put it is um, we have no way of verifying the truth claims that any inspired religious person presents us with. And so literally, and I guess his point would be there is no scientific way to distinguish a prophet from a false prophet. There's no way to distinguish somebody who um, is actually divinely inspired from somebody who is merely a zealot and uh, some kind of enthusiast and just sort of uh, off their rocker, so to speak. And because there's no way to scientifically, and what I mean by that is to, um, with certainty, verify the connection between, say, an individual and this external divine being, it doesn't mean that everything ever spoken by prophets or religious folks is false. It just means we have no, as Kant put, we have no touchstone. We have no touchstone by which we could assess such claims and distinguish the true ones from the false ones, and thus we are authorized to view all of them with skepticism. I mean, in the Old Testament, right, this is why Jehovah Yahweh had to give give the people signs, didn't didn't he? Right? They used to have contests between uh, these ancient Israeli and Palestinian tribes over whose deities would sort of cause a lightning strike or or do, or do various things to sort of prove and verify in their minds uh, who had a better connection to the divine. Now, the alternative, right, um, would be the internal intellectual principle, and that is going to be closer, I think, to what Kant's getting at here. So, he rejects the idea of this external principle. It follows, therefore, in the middle of page 14, that the basic moral principles of the first, the internal kind of intellectual principle, and then he writes it again in Latin, principium morale est intellectuale internum, right? Um, the moral principle is you know, an internal intellectual principle. So, all imperatives, he goes on to say, are formulae of a practical necessitation. Right? An imperative is do this, do something, be honest, don't lie. That means now I'm in this situation and boy, telling a lie might be convenient, but I better not. Practical necessitation is the necessitating of a free action. Right? You can still make the wrong decision here. And that's, I think, you know, What's so interesting about ethics? But all our free actions may be necessitated, Kant writes, in two ways. They may, may be necessary in accordance with laws of the free will, when their necessity is practical, 
that's going to be what he has in mind here. Or they can be free actions, can be necessary um, when they are in accordance with laws of our sensuous inclination, when their necessity is pathological. Okay, and you know, let's not over um, overanalyze things here, right? Free action necessitated according, you know, to the laws of sensuous inclination when the necessity is pathological. It's something, it can be a something as simple as, boy, I'm experiencing a pain in my chest. That sucks. I better go see the doctor. <laughs> right? You have a bodily sensation. Uh, you are suffering some symptom. You don't have to go to the doctor. You can ignore it, right? And maybe uh, it gets worse or something. But the, the practical necessitation there is, uh-oh, something's wrong. I'm feeling it. I feel something wrong. I better do something about it. Go get a, a test. Go see a doctor. Okay. Um, accordingly, actions are either determined practically in accordance with laws of freedom or pathologically according to the laws of our sensuous nature. And, you know, there are even more basic sort of necessary laws of our sensuous nature, the sorts of things our bodies do regularly without having to consciously think about them and such, right? Um, practical determination is an objective determination of the free act. Well, pathological determination is subjective. And so, you know, the practical determination of the object of determination, or sorry, practical determination here is going to be something like for anyone, any rational agent capable of doing the right thing and thinking about what they're doing will be able to choose to do the right thing here. And it'll be the same for everyone. Whereas pathological determination is subjective, right? Just because I'm having a pain in my chest doesn't mean you need to go see the doctor, right? So what's practically necessary for me as a sensuous being can be very different from what's necessary for you. And yet that's not the case with the other form of, pra of practical determination. What should we do? It turns out we should do the same thing. We're both human beings with the power of reason. Accordingly, all objective laws of action are practically and not pathologically necessary. Well, thank God. Um, so in other words, right, all objective laws of action are things that are practically necessary. They are not sort of responses to something terrible about human nature. That's another thing going on in the background here. Kant, you know, is a religious thinker in some sense, but he doesn't sort of want to argue that human beings, because of their embodiment, are sort of naturally sinful and therefore must, you know, flagellate themselves to punish themselves or something like this. That's one thing he's getting at there. So when we talk about something being practically necessary, a moral, morally necessary, uh, a moral imperative, a categorical imperative in the language of Kant, what are we talking about here? You look on 15, the middle of the page, Kant writes that moral necessitation constitutes an obligation. That's what we're talking about, an obligation, not a law, not something on the books, not something that somebody, you know, um, you know can lay down uh for others, but really something that we, if we think about what we're doing, we feel as an obligation, that we recognize as an obligation. So an obligation, Kant goes on to say, implies not that an action is necessary merely. So it's not just, we got to do this, we should do this, this is what ought to happen. An obligation implies not just that the action is necessary, but that it is made necessary. It's not a question of, necessitas, but of necessitatio, okay? So it's not a question of necessity, it's a question of necessitating, <laughs> is the way I'd put this in English, right? In other words, we gotta do something here uh, with our minds, that is, we have to make this obligation real for ourselves by exercising our reason and understanding why it is that this is the right thing for me to do, it would be the right thing for you to do if you were here too it's the right thing for anyone in this situation to do come to a complete stop at the stop sign for example again you, you look around not many people are doing it right um and that's because not many people come what they're doing the reasoning that would lead you to understand why that custom exists why that 
how that's an you know how that uh, how those signs and those four way stops are the result of people reasoning and coming up with something that works for every person engaged in that activity of driving an automobile from point A to point B. All right. Um, so let's think more about this necessitation on page 16. You must eat when you are hungry and you have something to eat. Hey, that's pretty simple. Um, here's an imperative, right? Suppose I, I say you must eat when you are hungry and you have something to eat. So, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. So straightforward, nobody, you know, you'll hardly ever find somebody explicitly formulating that. But that is a principle of action. Um, and it's a moral principle of action. If somebody is hungry and there's food present, they must eat, right? Whether or not, for instance, they can afford the food. How about that? All right. Yeah, I don't know if Kyle would necessarily agree with me there, but that's, Kyle and I will have to agree to disagree on that, on that question. Um, here we have both an obligation and a subjective necessity. Consequently, necessitation falls away. There is no obligation. Okay, we have both an objective and a subjective necessity. In other words, um, great. This is something where you can have this feeling, right? This feeling of hunger. And that's pathological. In other words, you're hungry. I'm not. I've eaten. But it's also, and so for you, right? you'd be feeling the subjective necessity, but then there's also, it's also sort of just true as a general rule that if a person is, anyways. So he says, in the case, therefore, of a perfect will for which the moral necessity is not only objective, but is also subjective, there is no room for necessitation or obligation. And see, we're not dealing, Kant says, with a perfect will. This would be the case for God, frankly, or a divine being, not the case for us. So in other words, um, you know, and this is a theological argument that he's having, right? But the idea being, divine being doesn't need to follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Ten Commandments, something like the Ten Commandments in the Christian tradition, the Old Testament, right? Would be something given by the divine being to the people um, for their salvation. But the very notion that this divine being itself would have to follow those rules for its own salvation um, for Kant is is logically inconsistent. It creates an infinite regress for every god. You need another god, essentially keeping that god in line. It will go on for eternity. Okay, so for that, for all those reasons, then he says, in the case of an imperfect will, though, and this is going to be of more relevance for us, for which the ethical good is objectively necessary. That's the right thing to do, and yet subjectively, do we have the right feelings? Do we want to do it? Are we feeling motivated to do something else, even though it's not the right thing to do? We can get away with it, it's to our advantage. So in the case of an imperfect will, we have a place for necessitation, and so also for obligation. We are capable of realizing what we should do and of holding ourselves to it and doing it despite, for instance, wanting to do something else. And we are actually capable of even more than that, of gradually disciplining and training ourselves to do the right thing for the right reason in time and ultimately leaving behind these feelings of resentment and frustration. Okay. Um, moral actions, cop reasons, must therefore be contingent if they are to be determined and human beings whose wills are ethical but imperfect are subject to obligation. So in other words, what he's getting at here is, you know, we have, in a sense, we generate these laws and principles that then guide our actions. And when we do so, though, we do so in a way that is universal, that he thinks everyone will do in the same way, right? In the way that mathematics, for instance, is kind of universal across cultures and times. All right. Um, you know, in the interest of time here, I'm going to wrap this up. I just want to look at two, two or three more passages. Let's see how quickly we can do this. On page 17, in the middle of the page, I think there's a really interesting passage here where thinking about for just a moment moral goodness consists in the submission of our will to rules whereby all our voluntary actions are brought into a harmony which is universally valid such a rule such a rule which forms the first principle of the possibility of the harmony of all free wills 
is the moral rule. So how do we all live together in a way that we follow rules, that we hold all of ourselves to, that we hold each and every one of us to. And the right thing for me is the right thing for you, and the wrong thing for me is the wrong thing for you. You know, one of the major reasons people today in the United States profoundly distrust their legal uh, institutions and the criminal justice system is precisely right because we do not feel like there's this harmony of all free wills and a moral rule that everyone is following. In other words, it really does seem like depending on your race, your, your economic class, your gender, and a variety of other factors, you have different outcomes in the legal system compared to someone else, right? Um, and this then leads to people realizing that to, despite all the talk of equality before the law and of, you know, one standard for everyone, the reality seems to be something very different from that. And there are, exist people with enough wealth and power that they seem like they can do whatever they like and never be held accountable. Whereas there are other folks on the bottom of the uh, pecking order here struggling who are um, excessively punished and harassed and sort of live constantly under threat of penalty for um, for fairly minor um, innocuous things. And so you have, you'll have people, you know, I was thinking of, you know, one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the last pardons um, of our previous president, Donald Trump, uh, was he pardoned somebody who had been in prison for years, and I believe it was for a nonviolent um, drug offense involving marijuana sales or distribution or something. And there's an example, right, of somebody who was spending their life in prison, essentially somewhere in the South, um, for doing something that is legal, increasingly legal and, and uh, op done openly or whatever in parts of the country. And, uh, and so there you have an example, right, of somebody who is literally uh, rotting in prison and has been separated from their family for how long, a decade possibly or more, uh, for doing something that uh, is legal in most parts of the country and that will be legal everywhere here before too long if there's any justice in the world and we want to sort of stop ruining people's lives for nonviolent um, Yes, to even begin to go down that rabbit hole. But the idea being, right, again, here we can see profound discrepancies of differences between outcomes, depending on, for example, did you come from a, you know, are you a white, wealthy man from a powerful family? Well, you get one outcome here if you get busted with a small amount of cocaine. Were you an African-American person in the inner city in the 1980s with a tiny amount of crack cocaine on you, what are the outcomes here, etc. How do we treat people who are addicted to prescription painkillers versus someone else with a small amount of marijuana or amphetamines or something like this in their possession? All just to say we see profoundly different outcomes. One person goes to a rehab in person, you know, in person care for several months in some cases. Somebody else spends potentially will spend their entire life in prison. So all of that then seems to suggest, right, we have not figured out how to harmonize our free wills properly so that we're all sort of holding each other to one sort of consistent rule. Okay, I think I've said enough for today. Thank you for joining me. Bye.